Biology students are obviously familiar with the term chromosome, and they probably remember at some point that in the cell cycle, um, the cell doesn't technically have chromosomes per se. We would like to refer to it as chromatin, the unwound form which is accessible. And then it is during prophase that the uh, DNA is more tightly packed to form these individual chromosomes, which can then be more easily uh, transported um, and moved to opposite uh, poles of the cell. And so the, um, uh, the cell uh, mitosis begins uh, with uh, unwound uh, chromatin and late prophase then has this uh, condensed, um, these condensed uh, chromosomes. Um, when we think of chromosomes, uh, they are physical structures. Uh, they are individual DNA molecules which are attached to a protein uh, scaffolding. And uh, they are important both in the number, so that we will talk about, you know, the diploid number of chromosomes in humans is 46 chromosomes. That's two sets of 23 kinds of uh, chromosomes. Um, but this uh, lecture is going to focus more on the structure of uh, chromosomes. So chromosomes have three regions which they need to uh, uh, possess, as we will see. Uh, they need to have a centromere, uh, and this is the area that those uh, microtubules during uh, mitosis, the kinetic core fibers attached, so that uh, chromosomes uh, can be uh, moved to uh, the appropriate poles of the cell. As we will see, they will have to have an area uh, known as uh, telomeres at the end of the chromosomes, and they have to have uh, regions which will initiate um, uh, at, at the replication of uh, the DNA. And so we have um, structures in uh, that need to be present in, uh, in chromosomes. So what is a chromosome? Well, you have a lot of DNA in a cell. So in a cheek cell, if you were to take the DNA in one single nucleus, it would stretch to be you know, almost six feet long. That is an incredible amount of, uh, of DNA. Um, and so how does one move such an incredible amount of DNA in a microscopic cell or split it into two uh, piles? Well, you have to condense it. And so if we imagine that this blue stretch is the DNA, there are these uh, proteins known as histone proteins. And what uh, happens as we pack the DNA is that these histone proteins with their positive charge attract the negatively charged uh, DNA. So that about 150 base pairs of DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins. So it gets wrapped almost twice around the, uh, the histone proteins. Um, and so there's this uh, histone uh, core made of six proteins. Um, and so uh, then there may be a linker uh, a linker region with 50 base pairs um, before we then do that again. And so this forms what's known as a nucleosome. The DNA wrapped almost twice around a histone core forms a nucleosome and about 50 base pairs later, we would form another nucleosome. And about 50 base pairs later, we would form another nucleosome. And if we wrap the DNA um, uh, this uh, way, you could take a chromosome who's, uh, that may be ma uh, measured an inch in length and now uh, condense it to the point where it was now only about a millimeter in length. So clearly this is making uh, the DNA more manageable, a, a denser, more tightly packed uh, structure, which would be easier to move, say, in cell division. Now, uh, this is... Um, a typical uh, a structure for DNA. And then also the reason why bacteria can say turn on transcription and make genes active so quickly, whereas in eukaryotes, it takes more time because the only way for genes to be active is if they are not wrapped around histones. So one would have to unwrap uh, the histones, which takes a eukaryotes more 
uh, time. There might be some regions of the uh, DNA which wouldn't be wrapped around histones, such as promoter regions of genes or areas where DNA replication uh, starts. And so as we start to form a chromosome and start to pack our DNA, the formation of nucleosomes would be step one. And then groups of six nucleosomes can be uh, packed together in what is known as a solenoid. This would be the second um, step, which would then uh, pack it um, a packet uh, further. So there are six, uh, uh, six histone proteins. DNA is wrapped almost uh, twice around. And then if you were to take six of those nucleosomes, uh, you would then form a solenoid. Uh, and so uh, this then is the uh, second um, level of DNA packing. The solenoid, so here's a solenoid, there's a solenoid, then a solenoid. Uh, solenoids can then form giant supercoils, which would then package uh, the DNA further. And the blue here represents a protein scaffolding for a chromosome. If you were to look at a chromosome and it has a specific uh, shape, the reason it has that shape is because the DNA will be attached to proteins which have that shape. There's a protein scaffolding um, for uh, that, uh, that chromosome. And see so here, those super coils are then attached to a uh, protein scaffolding. And this will then uh, give that shape of the metaphase uh, chromosome uh, that it has. So that is how chromosomes um, uh, have uh, that, uh, that specific uh, shape. Um, obviously, as discussed in uh, mitosis and uh, DNA replication, there is an S phase where DNA is uh, replicated. And we know that there are specific origins of replication in DNA sequences. So, you know, when we start replicating our DNA, it doesn't happen just anywhere. It happens at specific sequences. So chromosomes must possess origins of replication where the DNA is replicated. Chromosomes must uh, contain a centromere uh, region, which has specific DNA, which allows for its packing and allows for the binding of uh, proteins. And these proteins then um, bind to those uh, microtubules uh, whose actions will help to guide uh, the movement of uh, the uh, uh, the chromosomes. So centromeres have specific regions of DNA. They are um, a heterochromatin, so they are tightly packed. They are not euchromatin because there's not genes here. Uh, so it's DNA, but it's not coding for proteins. It sequences binds, you know, specific proteins, which allows uh, for the centromere to be the place where these microtubules can attach and thus uh, the proteins can be correctly guided to opposite poles of, uh, of the cell. So uh, that is a uh, needed region of, the, uh, of a chromosome. So chromosomes must have origins of replication, while a bacterial chromosome might only have uh, one on its small circular uh, chromosome. Uh, a mammalian uh, cell, uh, a mammalian chromosome might have 10,000. Um, uh, so that there are, uh, not, there's not, instead of one site where replication begins, there's these replicons, these areas which are, uh, are uh, replicated. Um, plasmids need something similar. Uh, they need an ARS um, uh, sequence if the DNA is to become replicated. Uh, there needs to be a centromere so that the DNA can be moved to the appropriate part of the cell. And once again, there are specific sequences there. In yeast, 250 base pairs uh, represent this sequence, while in higher eukaryotes, um, there are tens of thousands of base pairs. Once again, this is DNA, but it's not coding for, um, uh, for uh, uh, protein, um, but instead it's needed for the correct movement of the cell. And then finally, there are um, telomeres which are needed uh, for the correct um, movement of uh, chromosomes. So uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, just um, the maintenance of chromosomes. So telomeres are the ends of uh, a chromosome and something special happens 
uh, needs to happen at uh, the end. Because if we were to think back to DNA replication, uh, we recall that DNA polymerase can't um, bind to the single-stranded DNA. Uh, instead, there has to be an RNA primer. Fine. The RNA primer then has to be replaced uh, with a DNA uh, so that it's not RNA nucleotides here in green uh, with the green uh, sugar ribose, but rather the DNA uh, nucleotides with the uh, red sugar deoxyribose. So um, here, a RNA primer is being replaced. Fine. Here, an RNA primer is being replaced. Fine. Same thing here. Fine. And the reason it's being replaced is in all of the ones that I just pointed out, the new nucleotides can um, be added in a five prime uh, to a three prime uh, direction. Once again, new nu nucleotides can only come in with their five prime end first, as, they, as that one just did, as this one is uh, doing now, etc. But there's a problem. The problem is what happens here? Because that primer has to be removed as well. But the problem is if we were to add new nucleotides in the five prime to three prime direction, that would mean there would have to be a nucleotide right here so that new nucleotides could be added. But there's not. DNA polymerase cannot add the DNA nucleotides, which would replace the removed RNA uh, primer nucleotides here. So unless we can think of something else to do, that means that uh, there is a section which isn't replicated. And when this becomes single-stranded DNA in the next round of cell division, this chromosome is now shorter than it was the last time. And then that will happen again the next round of cell division, that there will be tel uh, telomeric DNA which can't be replicated, making the chromosome shorter. And that would then happen again and again and again. And at some point, the chromosomes would be too short and could no longer replicate, all right? So the ends of the chromosome, telomeres, we need something special so that the chromosomes do not shorten with each cell division, which would ultimately then uh, lead uh, to they're no longer being able to be replicated. So telomeres, once again, have um, DNA sequences uh, which are not coding for protein, all right? So once again, not all DNA codes for protein. Um, and in uh, human telomeres, the sequence TTAGGG is repeated um, uh, many times, up to 100,000 times. Just as in the centromere, there are proteins which bind these unique sequences. There are proteins <clears throat> which bind to the sequences of centromeres. There are proteins which bind to the sequences of, uh, of telomeres. And there is an enzyme which is active here called telomerase. Telomerase is going to use RNA as the, um, uh, the sequence uh, being uh, used uh, to uh, form new DNA nucleotides uh, here, the template. So that's unusual. We usually think of this uh, process working in the reverse direction in that DNA is the template from which you make an RNA copy. But here RNA is going to be the template from which you make DNA nucleotides to fill in this space. The enzyme which does this is then called a reverse transcriptase. Instead of using DNA as the template for RNA in transcription, we are using RNA as the um, template for DNA uh, uh, replication. Now, reverse transcriptase is often famous because viruses can do that from HIV uh, to uh, coronavirus. If they're using RNA as their genetic code, they have to convert that into DNA. So there's a reverse transcriptase. And there are uh, uh, drugs uh, which can then uh, try to block viral replication by inhibiting reverse transcriptase. But here is a reverse transcriptase which humans use. So there is a um, RNA uh, uh, sequence which will now then be used as um, uh, the, uh, the template for DNA 
uh, replication. So notice that this complex is not only protein, but also RNA. So we use the term ribonucleoprotein to uh, indicate uh, that it is a composite structure made of these two different components, both protein and RNA. And we will then use this uh, template uh, to add uh, DNA uh, nucleotides um, uh, here um, because uh, uh, we would not be able uh, to uh, use a plain old uh, DNA uh, polymerase uh, to, uh, uh, to do that. Okay, so uh, the good news is then uh, we do not have to have our chromosomes get shorter and shorter with each cell division getting to the point uh, at some point where um, uh, we would uh, now not, no longer be able to replicate a um, a, uh, a, a chromosome. But it's more complicated than that and, and thus fascinating in that we obviously need telomerase then in what's called the germ line. So for example, um, this cell, which was a part of a woman's body, if fertilized, this ovum is now going to be the, the zygote that starts a new embryo. Thus, how many cell divisions must it undergo? undergo? The answer is infinite, all right? Because this cell, when fertilized, has to divide and divide and divide and make a whole new person, and including their gametes, which when fertilized will make a whole new person, and their gametes, which make a whole new person, you know, when fertilized, et cetera. So how many cell divisions must this cell be prepared to undergo? an infinite number because it is this germline which will continue the species. So obviously these cells need to be immortal. They need to have an unlimited number of potential cell divisions. And so therefore telomerase, the enzyme which extends the ends of chromosomes and allows them to divide without shortening, telomerase must be active in what's called the germline. But here's a problem. These cells are bad. They are cancerous. And if they were allowed to have an infinite number of cell uh, divisions, then the problem would be that this could cause then a life-threatening cancer. So while telomerase can be expressed and make cells immortal, and that this is essential in the germline, telomerase is turned off in most body cells, so that most body cells get, uh, their chromosomes do get shorter and shorter. Um, and so that if you were trying to get a tissue culture and have a cell line going of just a regular, um, a regular uh, a cell, the cell um, that has telomerase, uh, no, I'm sorry, the cell without telomerase, its chromosomes will shorten with each cell cycle. It will become less able to repair itself, and at a certain point, it can't divide, all right? So the good news is that it could not then make an effective cancer cell because most cells then only have so many cell divisions in them. Beyond a certain point, they just can't divide. They can't repair uh, themselves. And so if you had a cell that's going bad, if it's becoming potentially cancerous, um, if telomerase is not being expressed, it's not immortal. The, it will divide a number of times to make abnormal cells, but then uh, there's a fixed number of those cells. However, the cell on the right, if it expresses telomerase, then its uh, chromosomes do not shorten. It then is immortal. And now, unlike this cell, which has stopped dividing, it can divide and divide and divide and make tumors which spread and spread. And then, you know, potentially, um, uh, you know, it can then become uh, life-threatening, uh, um, which is why uh, as a defense mechanism, uh, as cells differentiate, you know, and, you know, leave the cell cycle becoming differentiated in the, in the G0 phase, many of them stop making telomerase so that uh, they do not have an uh, infinite number of cell divisions uh, in them. 
Now, if most of our cells are trying to protect us from cancer by limiting their cell divisions, that's good, all right? The, but there is a downside. The, the downside is that we get older, all right? That we age. As we age, well, we just don't heal as well as we could. Many of our, you know, our cells just aren't functioning as well as, as they could. We can't repair things as well as we could because we're trying not to. So here's the problem. Um, we don't want to age, but we don't want to have cancer either, all right? And so um, by keeping telomerase on in the germline, but by limiting it um, elsewhere, uh, you're trying to, um, uh, you know, be able to propagate the species, but nevertheless have uh, defense against cancer. Many cancer cells, what makes them a successful cancer, which then threatens the life of the patient, is that while telomerase should be turned off in that cell, it has instead been turned on once again. Um, uh, and so, you know, cancer cells are abnormal by definition, and some of that abnormality might be uh, they're expressing telomerase when they should not. So there are three regions that a chromosome needs to have, uh, areas uh, uh, where DNA replication uh, can uh, start, um, a centromere and a uh, telomere. Now, as covered uh, elsewhere, DNA can be tightly uh, packed to form heterochromatin, and then it can be more loosely packed to form euchromatin. Transcription and gene activity occurs in the loosely packed euchromatin. Um, uh, transcription and gene activity does not occur in the more tightly uh, packed uh, heterochromatin. As we look at chromosomes, some parts of it are what's called constitutive heterochromatin. It's always heterochromatin. There are no genes there that get expressed. It is never unwound. So centromeres, okay, are constitutive heterochromatin. Uh, telomeres, um, the same. We are not expressing genes in these uh, areas. And there are proteins in the nucleus, uh, which bind uh, to uh, heterochromatin. So uh, we think of DNA as, oh, this is needed to you know, code for uh, proteins, but it's also needed because proteins will bind to heterochromatin and direct it. These proteins are called lamins. They form the cytoskeleton of the nucleus, or at least most of it. Um, so the nuclear lamina will uh, preferentially bind to tightly uh, wound uh, heterochromatin. And thus, DNA can uh, be moved um, uh, appropriately. Um, there can be uh, proteins, uh, which are not only in the nuclear envelope, but which are also in the uh, cytoplasm, uh, which link things. So microtubules in the cytoplasm can then uh, attach uh, to these proteins, which can then attach uh, to uh, heterochromatin. Um, and so chromosomes uh, can uh, be uh, moved. Uh, areas of the uh, chromosome which are not being used can now be moved towards the edges of the nucleus, while active uh, areas with active genes can now uh, lo uh, be located more in the middle of the, uh, the nucleus. And so uh, heterochromatin, uh, is not just something which forms uh, when we're packaging cells uh, or when we're packaging chromosomes uh, for cell division in prophase. Uh, there is constitutive heterochromatin, which is tightly bound all uh, the time. And then there can be facultative heterochromatin so that you know liver cells can turn off the gene areas that the brain cells are using and vice versa. And this the locations of this heterochromatin can then be important with you know where proteins bind, uh, where the, the chromosome is located in the nucleus, which parts are, are co closer to the edge versus um, more in um, uh, the middle, uh, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, heterochromatin uh, uh, is, you know, thus uh, important. Um, and while some of it uh, functions in the regulation of genes, all right, so, you know, we can activate genes by taking what's tightly bound heterochromatin and making it euchromatin, and this can change over time, all right, so we see that, you know, in human development, the epsilon globin gene 
becomes euchromatin before the gamma globin genes do, and then the beta globin and delta globin genes become uh, uh, euchromatin uh, afterwards. Um, but then also, once again, some heterochromatin has other uh, uh, functions. Uh, a classic example of that is um, the X chromosome inactivation in, uh, in women. So if you recall from you know, talking about uh, sex uh, linkage. If you recall talking about uh, sex uh, linkage, the uh, X chromosome um, is present in both men and women, but women have two copies, All right, they're, they are XX, whereas men are XY. And that then has a potential consequence on a gene uh, expression because um, the Y chromosome is small and, and doesn't have anywhere near the same number of genes, the Y chromosome being say about the same size as the small chromosomes 21 and, tw excuse me, 22, while the X chromosome is very big with a, you know, about the same number, you know, about the size of chromosome four. Uh, so uh, uh, if you recall, uh, you know, women have uh, two copies of genes, which is why a woman who, say, has a recessive mutation for colorblindness isn't colorblind, all right, because uh, the, her other X chromosome has the good copy of the gene which compensates for it, whereas the man with only uh, this one X chromosome uh, then would uh, be uh, vulnerable. So uh, that helps with hemophilia, but there's a, a larger question. Since there are so many genes here, does that mean that women have double the amount of gene product as men for all of these genes? If you recall, gene dosage is a problem. Having an extra chromosome is usually lethal because you just get too much gene product and you know the human, uh, so that's just not compatible with normal um, development. And the same is true here. If a female embryo um, has both of these turned on and, and keeps them on, both of these X chromosomes, um, that's lethal. Uh, the embryo is not born alive. So having you know, full expression on both of these X chromosomes, it's incompatible with life because that would just change the level of uh, gene expression um, you just couldn't do that. Men and women aren't that different where, you know, women would have double the amount of gene product of all of the genes located here. So how is this uh, managed? Well, one of these two X chromosomes is then turned off. Um, it's highly condensed into what's called a bar body. And if you look at, um, if uh, you stain, uh, say, cheek cells in a, from a woman and a man, you'll notice that in the woman's cells, there's a small dot in the nucleus of highly condensed uh, chromosomes, which is the bar body. One of the X chromosomes is turned off. Males don't have that. And so the way that females survive having, you know, two sets of all of these um, uh, genes when only one set results in uh, normal development is that she will at random pick one of these X chromosomes and then turn uh, them off. So for example, to mention colorblindness. So in general, we would say, oh, you know, the woman would not be colorblind because she's a carrier. But it could be a little more complicated than that in that if these X chromosomes get turned off at random, that would mean in say the woman's, you know, right eye, um, some of the uh, cells which developed from the part of the embryo that you know, turned off this chromosome um, would now be colorblind because uh, only the one uh, with the mutation is being expressed. Um, or if this was the only one that was being expressed, she would allow color vision. So overall, she notices that she does have color vision. What she doesn't notice is that portions of her retina or maybe the retina of one eye would be colorblind while the other one uh, uh, wouldn't. Uh, and so uh, the uh, X chromosomes, this one will be the only one primarily expressed in most cells. This one uh, will be the only one expressed in other cells. Now I'll explain how that happens in just a second, um, but I do wanna just correct something. 
whereas uh, what I said just said a second ago is mostly true, all right? It turns out that when the X chromosomes are turned off, so like let's say a woman's gonna turn off this X chromosome, it turns out that some areas, even on the one which is inactivated, will actually still be expressed. So while X chromosome inactivation will inactivate most of the chromosome, not all of it. And so therefore, there are some genes on the X chromosome that women are expressing two copies of, um, while men are only expressing one. Um, these genes are what are called pseudo-autosomal. Are they on the X chromosome? Yes. Should they be sex-linked? Yes, but in women, um, uh, uh, because uh, women are expressing uh, both um, uh, copies, uh, they're almost acting as if they're not on the X chromosome, which where one is inactivated, they're acting like an, an autosome where women now have two versions of this gene. And with coronavirus, that's important um, because uh, the ACE2 uh, gene, which is the receptor for coronavirus, is in one of these pseudo-autosomal uh, regions of the X chromosome, which means that women are expressing um, more than uh, men are. And if we're trying to answer the question, why is it that men are more likely to be affected by coronavirus than uh, women, there are probably uh, multiple uh, reasons, uh, but one of them is thought to be that the amount of this ACE2 uh, protein, uh, which uh, while serving as the receptor for coronavirus, and that's bad, um, it also then limits the inflammation, uh, which ends up causing the complications, uh, which uh, affect um, uh, so much of the uh, uh, so many of the uh, the symptoms, uh, and so having a higher level of ACE2 is actually then good. Uh, so because women express more ACE2, uh, they're less likely to get those severe infections, which is one of the reasons then that uh, it seems that coronavirus is is uh, having more. Um, this is just kind of asking where you would get your information about coronavirus. Um, uh, so this is just of interest that. Uh, pseudo-autosomal uh, expression might affect coronavirus uh, susceptibility. Okay. Uh, but then getting back to uh, how the X chromosome is uh, turned off, um, it turns out that X chromosomes have a region of DNA um, which is not coding for protein, but is the center which is going to govern the uh, inactivation of an X chromosome. Uh, it is called ZIC. It's on the Q arm, the long arm in region 13.2. And there are in, are in two important um, genes uh, here. Uh, there is a T6 uh, here in green. Uh, the expression of this area will then prevent the inactivation of an X chromosome. And then there is ZIST in purple. The expression here will cause the inactivation of an X chromosome. All right. Um, now, there are proteins which can bind here and uh, determine which one is active. So for a long uh, time, or I'm sorry, uh, for early embryonic development, um, the T6 is being uh, expressed on both X chromosomes, which is why neither is inactivated. But early in embryonic uh, development, the X chromosomes contact each other, all right? So they, they physically touch. And after this physical touching, one of the X chromosomes will continue to make the green T6 and not be inactivated, but the other one will now start to express the purple zist. And this happens at random so that a woman's body therefore is a patchwork. Some of her body is expressing the X chromosome that she got from her mother while other portions of her body are expressing the X chromosome she got from her father. The ZIST uh, gene codes for RNA, which never becomes protein, a big molecule of, uh, of RNA, which then binds a protein known as polycomb. And then the ZIST RNA, 
which binds this protein then sticks to that one um, X chromosome. And this is then the cause why that then becomes inactivated forming that bar body. It forms a bar body because there are then changes with the histone proteins, changes in the packaging of the DNA. Uh, therefore, these would be called epigenetic changes. So once again, one of these X chromosomes will always be off now for the rest of the, their life, um, while one will be on. There were no changes to the DNA sequence. These were epigenetic sequences on methylation and histones, uh, which then led to changes in the packing of the DNA, which, are, uh, which is then uh, permanent. Um, and so this occurs at random during embryonic uh, development in, um, uh, in uh, women's uh, bodies. Um, with uh, chromosomes, uh, it's, it's wonderful to, to talk about them. It's even better to visualize them. And there are organisms like Drosophila, uh, where in the larvae and their salivary glands, there are these giant polyteen chromosomes, which are so much bigger than human uh, chromosomes. And so um, uh, uh, these are uh, wonderful um, simply because now uh, we can visualize uh, the chromosome because they're just so easy to see. Why are Drosophila chromosomes just so big? Well, it's because the chromosomes can be replicated. So the DNA is replicated, so now there's uh, another copy, but they stay attached to each other. And then they get replicated again and again and again and again. And because there are so many duplicates of the same uh, molecule uh, of DNA, which then remain attached to each other, it forms this giant um, uh, 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 chromosome. So 10 rounds of DNA uh, replication without cell division produces more than a thousand copies of these chromosomes, uh, which are then uh, joined uh, to form these large interphase uh, chromosomes. And one of the things that is uh, exciting is then you could watch how um, you could then use this as a study of chromosomes. So if you were asking, you know, do fruit flies have a version of this gene product? Well, you could actually see where the probe is binding on these chromosomes because the chromosomes are so big. It's easier to visualize in that sense. And also um, you could watch how gene expression changes the packing of DNA. Remember the tightly packed heterochromatin is not where uh, genes are being expressed. They are expressed in the loosely packed euchromatin. Well, you can watch as Drosophila larvae develop that at a certain uh, point, you know, certain areas will become euchromatin, meaning that the genes are then active uh, there, um, but then uh, they will condense. So notice that not all areas become euchromatin at once. So, you know, an early larval instar might unpack these regions, while a later larval instar would then unpack other regions. So you can visually see these, they're called chromosome puffs, but that gene, uh, the fruit flies are controlling gene expression so that when the DNA is too tightly packed, DNA expression uh, is not occurring in those regions. Uh, so uh, those genes are not being used, but at a different stage of development, they, uh, they are. We know this now, but before that you know, was known, these giant uh, fruit fly uh, chromosomes uh, were wonderful examples of visualizing uh, how gene expression can change uh, over uh, time. Now, uh, the next video will go through sequences and, and get into things like jumping genes, et cetera. Um, and then later, uh, you know, we get into more evolutionary questions and speciation and the like. Um, but it should then be noted that chromosome, their number, their, the numbers vary far more than most people uh, appreciate in groups of related organisms. So there are mechanisms apparently not uncommon ones, where multiple small chromosomes, small chromosomes could fuse and make a big chromosome, or big chromosomes can then break and form smaller chromosomes. And if we were to look at any uh, group, but let's just stick with primates for right now, 
here's a family of lemurs, not even all lemurs, just, you know, a family. Some members of the family have 44 chromosomes, some have 62. Now, they're related to each other. I mean, not only are they all lemurs, but they're lemurs in one of the four families of lemurs. Um, but you can see that from common ancestors, there have been changes to chromosomes so that now the numbers of chromosomes as one jumps from one member of the family to another, it can vary greatly. So here are the, the lemurs. These are four families of lemurs. In all of them, chromosome number can vary significantly. So in some, little chromosomes have uh, fused to make bigger chromosomes. In other ones, uh, big chromosomes have split to make smaller chromosomes. Apparently it happens. If you were to look at these new world monkeys, look at the numbers of chromosomes. Then the source I had even said that uh, one species has an odd uh, number of chromosomes. And, um, I've read that uh, a couple of times, although I'm not quite sure how that works. Um, and there is a second uh, family of new world monkeys and the same thing would be true. So notice that chromosome number changes and apparently this is important here's the other family of new world monkeys, in speciation, all right? And so if you were to look then at the uh, uh, old world monkeys, some have 42 chromosomes as their diploid count, uh, 44, uh, 48, 50, 54. Gibbons, some have 44, some have uh, 52 uh, chromosomes. And so uh, one of the aspects of chromosomes is that they, they must be able to break and reform. And while this could be potentially, you know, a, a devastating mutation, which might cause sterility or other problems, apparently it has a role in speciation. And what I just said isn't unique to uh, primates. Um, it, it's typical, you know, throughout all organisms, you know, from, in, from plants to invertebrates to, to vertebrates. And it had a role in more recent human ancestry. Because if you look at chimps, gorillas, uh, and orangutans, um, they don't have 46 chromosomes as a diploid count, they have 48. And if we ask why they have 48, the answer is that where humans have one large chromosome two, it's the second largest chromosome, which is why it's numbered chromosome two. Um, uh, these other uh, apes have uh, a small chromosome, which matches the top part of our chromosome two, and a, a large uh, and another small chromosome, which matches the bottom part of our chromosome two. So we have one chromosome two. They have two separate chromosomes, which match the two halves of our chromosome two. What seems to have happened at some point in uh, recent uh, primate history in the evolution of the family Homininae is that two small ape chromosomes fused to make the one large human, uh, human chromosome two, which is why we have a diploid count of 46 chromosomes and they have a diploid count of 48, all right? And so changes in chromosome number seem to be uh, important in uh, evolution, as are uh, changes in uh, blocks of chromosomes. So if you were to simply, we'll just pick humans and mice, but this would you know, be evident in other groups uh, as well. If you were to ask, um, do mice have most of the same genes we have? Yes. Do they have the genes distributed randomly? I mean, just because they have the same genes, they don't mean that they have to, the genes on our chromosome one don't have to be on their chromosome one or they don't have to be linked. Well, we see an interesting pattern where human chromosomes don't correspond to mouse chromosomes individually. But parts of human chromosome one match mouse chromosome one, three, four, and eight. So we don't have all of the human you know, genes on chromosome one on one mouse chromosome, um, but they do occur in blocks, all right? And uh, the same then is uh, true of chromosome two and three. And so if you were to then say, all right, let's pick each color of the human chromosome, the blocks of these human chromosomes, they match the blocks on mouse chromosomes, um, but only in segments. So it seems that uh, one of the things that happens is that chromosomes um, during evolution uh, break apart where, you know, translocation might move a part of chromosome, you know, whatever in this species to another chromosome, uh, to another chromosome. And this then um, 
in the daughter species, uh, then means that they have the same genes, but just in a different order. So mouse chromosomes have not only most of the same genes, but in most of the same orders for a while in these blocks, but it's clear that blocks can move so that not all of the blocks which we all know on chromosome one have always been um, uh, on uh, chromosome uh, one. And so just here I am talking about, uh, um, uh, here I am uh, talking about uh, chromosomes and their structure. Um, but obviously, uh, when uh, on a topic, say speciation, it seems that uh, chromosomes fusions and fissions, uh, the, the movement of blocks is important when it comes uh, to uh, a different uh, uh, species. And this is why then, uh, you know, chromosomal differences uh, are why many uh, species can't reproduce uh, together um, because uh, this would then change gene dosage. If they have different numbers of chromosomes, the chromosomes don't match up. If you had a hybrid that had chromosomes uh, whose uh, parents were two different um, uh, species, uh, that might lead to problems in the offspring as you know, a discussion of uh, speciation can uh, mention. Uh, and so as, if you look at, oh, here's gray tree frogs and they look the same to me, or here we see you know, different, you know, two, what we call different species that aren't reproducing well uh, together or at all. You ask, but they look so similar. Why are they different species? One of the reasons is often that they vary in the number of chromosomes. You saw that in the lemurs before, or sometimes polyploidy, there's a, a species that has double the number of chromosomes as its related species. So Cope's gray tree frog has 24 uh, chromosomes with the common gray tree frog has 48. Um, this is common where apparently there was a polyploid accident uh, where now uh, there was frogs which had double the number of chromosomes as uh, their ancestors, which kind of created a new species. So chromosome breakage, refusing, you know, mutations which uh, uh, change the number of chromosomes, uh, this then is a topic for speciation uh, as, as well. Apparently, it's a very common uh, cause of speciation. 